So this, okay, actually I right now I don't even have memory in here. So this Super Socket 7 motherboard, by the way I just realized it has sound on board, um, has, has it also VGA on board or? Actually it even has VGA on board, uh, interesting. Um, This was my second computer that I purchased myself. Initially I worked the first 10 years or so with a 386 SX25 of my father's. And in the beginning we did not even had a hard disk and in the very beginning also not color graphics. So only later we installed a quite expensive 40 megabyte hard disk and later a VGA card. And I used this PC for a very very long time and uh, Obviously I was like 8 or so, when everyone already had a 486 and such, I was still sitting and working and trying to play something with our 386 SX25, only 2 megabyte of RAM. And uh, I saved and saved and uh, obviously I was a child, couldn't save so much and sometimes also wanted to buy other things. The first PC I brought also with holiday work and distributing newspapers and such was then a 120 megahertz Pentium. Then I, for a short period of time, had the fastest PC on the block. But even that was a compromise. For example, I, in the very beginning, I even used probably an either VGA card for a few months or so until I could finally afford another VGA card and such. And anyway, the 120 MHz Intel Pentium was my actually first PC. Maybe I was 16 then, so approximately, maybe 15. <clears throat> maybe I need to carefully go over the years another day and check what year was what. And then I used this 120 MHz Pentium quite a long time, five years or something like that. And um, this was the second PC I brought. And under here is actually a 240 MHz uh, Windchip 2 that I mostly brought because it was said to be relatively fast for being quite cheap. So this is a quite entry-level cheap Socket 7 motherboard with this IDT Windchip. I think most of my early Linux compilation I did with this board and CPU, uh, 240 MHz. Uh, maybe something like 128 megabyte of ROM or something. And all the initial Rock Linux and then desktop Rock Linux work. As far as I remember, I probably did compile on this board. And as far as I remember, it was not that slow. I think it usually built like half of a week, I guess. Maybe three days or something for a base system. And maybe a week or so for a really full-featured KDE system or something like this. Anyway, let me collect some more parts, uh, memory, and see if it still works after really a long time in the attic. I have even some more bots like this. So today I only wanted to quickly check what works of this and then I may do some more retro videos over the year whenever I have time and fun with it. As a memory was a little bit hard to push in, I was not sure which is bank zero. Anyway, uh, let's switch it on and see what happens. Uh, does it have here speaker, turbo LED, reset switch, standby? And we have the first post, so thanks God this still works. Uh, first, I could not immediately figure out which of those pins is the power button, so I connected my ATX to AT adapter for the 386 motherboard that just gives power to avoid this. And then, first, it didn't work um, because I likely did not have the memory in the right slots there. Didn't, couldn't see a printout there for the first or second slot. But, and yeah, 225 megahertz uh, IDT Windchip 2. And um, we can later have some more fun with this and uh, test it fully, benchmark it, try DOS games, vintage Linux, overclock it slightly. So my old trusty Winship 2 is also still booting. Just curious how fast the flag decode is. But apparently on the first look I need to start some scientific benchmarking for some future video. On the first glance this is not so much slower than the overclocked K6 we had there a moment ago, that's interesting. Just for the fun I will try to overclock this also slightly, just a little bit from 220 something to 240, just to see if uh, that works. Although the eBay prices have gone up and for this rare stuff you could probably get a few more bucks. But back in the day I could not make tests like this, this was my only board. I spent all my savings on this, it had to work stable for weeks and months and years. But nowadays just for the YouTube and educational fun, I can make a quick test and hopefully the CPU will not burn and go up in flames immediately. Just interesting to see how much room there was, how much maxed out the uh, IDT 
manufacturing wars with the CPUs or if we can go a little bit higher. And then we will also continue with more modern videos again. Okay, but at least uh, the bare version is indeed not that super fast. The AMD K6 overflew this uh, FPS counter there and the IDT Winchip in the factory 225 megahertz configuration does not overflow it. Though, of course, the K6 also had nearly twice the clock speed anyway. Actually, there's something strange going on. I just realized the print on the CPU says 240 MHz. However, this is jumpered to 75 uh, multiplied by 3 or so, resulting in a 225 MHz. I have absolutely no recollection what is the story about this. If the 75 MHz bus frequency had some performance benefit or something, how I found it in the basement, it's apparently not running how it was supposed to run according to the spec. So I now quickly change this over to maybe to stock. 60 multiplied by, what is it, 4? And then also 66 megahertz just to see how that goes. And I guess there I found out why it's running in this configuration. This totally cheap integrated graphic and such motherboard had no 4 multiplayer. This is probably the reason why I had to configure it like this. Really interesting things to find. Let's try to Google or trial and error if we can change it or overclock it with a 75 megahertz bus frequency. So maybe we are running overclock to 266 megahertz. Turns out the board has a 4x and even higher clock multiplier settings. Maybe it's just not documented on the printout on the PCB. Okay, we are not running stable though. Interesting that all those CPUs, they were also different with all the risk core and so on, that they crash in quite different ways and crash patterns. And um, so yeah, so we changed the jumpers to 60. So I could always have run it on the intended target frequency. The question is, would have 60 MHz bus frequency multiplied by 4 resulted in higher CPU integer floating point performance than the memory access speed or PCI and such bus access would have been slower. In any case, it's certainly not very nice of the vendors not to print those jumper settings on the PCB or printed paper material. So we change the jumpers that's printed on here. This is 60 is 2, 3. 240, this is now as intended. That should hopefully boot. So then this chip is running really close to the theoretically maximum if it crashes as soon as we have it slightly overclocked. Yeah, 239. So now at the 240 spec clock we get 47.6 frames per second in this old 3D DOS bench that is running in pure software rendering. Need to check with the video if it was fast or slower and I give this overclocking one more shot. So now we are running overclock to 266 MHz by 66 multiplied by 4. At least this 3D bench it still passes. Let's try to boot Linux to see if this only slight overclock is stable enough to boot into Linux. This is 266. Actually I probably could have run it with the intended target speed from the first day because the CPU is apparently ignoring all the fractional multipliers. They were only implemented in the next revision of this WinChip. So many of these fractional multiplier settings like 1.5 or 3.5 result in a multiplier of 4 anyway. But uh, apparently even this slight overclock is not stable enough to survive Linux. Interesting. On an interesting side note, with significant higher V-core voltage, it's actually survived booting with 266 MHz. So 266. I increased this from where have we been? We have been at 3.2, which I'm not even sure was in spec because according to what I found on the internet, the voltage range is much higher. So I'm not even sure if I'm running it out of spec with... No, I'm here at the maximum of 3.5 volt. And as you can see so far, it Put it and worked. Would be interesting to know it so it's longer usage and starting X and compiling something. Maybe that's for another day. So interesting. Apparently increasing the voltage helps just as it does on modern Intel and AMD CPUs. Apparently this DOS benchmark overclocking result didn't really change much. Need to check with uh, previous videos in the video. But now adding this Matrox G450 as a real PCI graphic card. I don't think we get 11 now. Is this for sure overflows this counter, I guess, or I hope. Actually, it cannot be 11 
because the 386 has 11 and um, I guess we can totally not use this benchmark for any benchmarking as this counter is overflowing. So apparently adding the metric card changed a quite a bit. I think the video performance changed enormously though. But actually this is strange. This does also not... Wait a second, this is truncated there, this 261, it says 1261 megahertz. I guess it's time to not use this DOS benchmarks. Where are we getting now? Actually, it looks like we are now getting something way better. Need to check with what we recorded earlier, but uh, I think this is way higher now. Also, Linux with the Matrox G450 graphic card. Yeah, this is also way faster now. Interesting. Another day I need to come up with some nice benchmarks and see how all this affects the performance in case more people are interested in these vintage systems. I hope you also enjoyed this vintage tinkering with exotic systems, Super Circuit 7, overclocking those and uh, the very first onboard integrated graphics that came out in those days. Give it a thumbs up if you have and leave in the comments below what you liked and disliked. And don't forget to subscribe for all the next videos to come.